You might have missed it, but something really important happened this January. The iPhone turned 10 on January 9th, 2017. Happy birthday, iPhone. In 10 short years, from when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone as an iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator, whatever that means, uh, how quaint. Think about how far the iPhone has come in the last 10 years. We use it not just to read books or listen to music or watch movies or deposit checks or open hotel room doors and open our own front doors. Uh, we use it to control lights and heat and make travel reservations and the list goes on and on and on. The technology has come of age. In 10 years, Apple has gone from a stock market valuation of $75 billion to $740 billion. Apple is now the most valuable company in the world. That is what we are here to talk about today. Not Apple, but the economic potential that Apple makes possible. So while Apple is certainly an important story and it's ilk, Android, and, 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 and phones like that, what is far more important is the companies and the economic value that is being unleashed by the companies that are leveraging these platforms and other digital platforms as well. So let's just talk about a couple of examples. Lyft, who is here today, would not exist as a company if a smartphone platform did not exist. Companies like Spotify, which we listen to every day, would be far less useful without a smartphone platform. And that is what today is all about. How you and I, as managers, as executives, as educators, and yes, even as citizens, need to think about these technologies and what we ought to be doing to make our companies more competitive and to make our democracy more powerful and to make our society more successful. So let's start with the newest company that um, would not be possible without the smartphone platform, and that is Snapchat. As you know, they just went public <clears throat> with a market cap of over $20 billion just earlier this month. Think about that. It is a five-year-old software company with 2,000 employees that is worth $20 billion that is worth more than American Airlines with 900 aircraft, Best Buy with 900 stores, Motorola that launched the, tele the mobile phone revolution, and Viacom. And it is five years old and it has 2,000 people. That, my friends, is the power of software platforms. Many of us in this room probably don't even use Snapchat, <laughs> right? I <laughs> And you're all looking like, why is he, t I don't either, so don't feel bad. Uh, I tried and, and I didn't get it. Um, um, but I will say this, teens and millennials, which is their target market, use it all the time. So since most of us don't seem to use it, let me tell you a little bit about what it does. And its name says it all, snap to chat. You and I talk, teenagers and tweens even, and millennials, they text, but this is snaps as text. In my generation, we use photographs to memorialize important moments in our life, the Kodak moment. We stored them in photograph albums and we put them in shoe boxes and I still have my high school <laughs> photographs, right? Nobody ever sees them, um, but I do have them. This generation, uses photographs to communicate. A picture is worth a thousand words, right? And their newest product is these glasses, where if, if you just tap the button on the top right, it records a 10 second video of what you are looking at. So your friends, when you send them this message, actually see it from your perspective. Now, I, now we struggle with this but this is the number one social network for, tweens, for teens. 
It is a completely different way to communicate. The, it's interesting. It, has, it lives only in the moment. They share and chronicle their lives with their friends with pictures that disappear. Interesting. And they do this constantly. There is no past in Snapchat. There is no future in Snapchat. There is only today. Now, I wonder about what it's doing to their brains. Uh, uh, <laughs> but but we, we, we leave that to the neuroscientists. It's outside the scope of today's conference. Um, but there's a lot of research that talks about how brains are being rewired because of digital. Um, let's take another company, Spotify. As you all know, from the days of Napster and BitTorrent, the music industry has been devastated. Revenues have been plummeting. It forces aging rock stars like the Rolling Stones in their 70s to go on tour because that's the only way you could make money. And God knows I love the Rolling Stones, so it helps me. But here comes Spotify. They have 30 million tracks on their, in their cloud. 30, everybody except Taylor Swift. Um, um, I do know Taylor Swift, too. Um, and it has completely changed the model for the labels. Revenues at the labels are going up. Sony Music, Warner Brothers, Universal, all of, the, all of them are seeing increases in their revenues because of streaming. So the days of piracy are going away. So let's talk about what Spotify actually does. There's two models on Spotify. You can either listen to it for free in an ad-supported model, the way we're all used to, or you can pay 10 bucks a month and, and get unlimited music, right? 10 bucks a month doesn't even buy you one CD a month. And here you have access to 30 million songs. And it turns out that this business model is really powerful because half of them, half of the 100 million, the 50 million, are willing to pay $10 a month for, this, for the experience and for the convenience. What it tells us is that when you compete with free, which is what the option was through piracy and through YouTube and whatever else, you can find a model with experience, with convenience, that people are willing to pay for. Because we, as the technology comes of age, are beginning to get far more comfortable with these models where we are now willing to pay for the experience. We romanticize the way I grew up, for example. So listening to scratchy vinyl records and, and wishing for the days of the past. But the reality is that that was an extremely limited model, which we didn't realize at the time. Of course, we love discovering new musicians. But here's what happened. You had to listen to a radio station with ad-supported radio based on songs that the DJ chose to play for you. Or you could listen to songs in sequence in the way they were etched on the disc. These were extremely limiting options. We didn't think so at the time. Today, you can listen to any song you want. You can create playlists. I have a friend who has a great playlist, and he's always curating new music. And all I need to do is follow him. And get the, I don't even have to do the discovery myself. This is really powerful. Now, here's what's even more interesting. Guess what we listen to? With the millions of songs available, with all of these indie artists out there, we regress to the labels. When there is so much selection, people are actually going back to the popular songs. And I'll just leave you with one statistic. The top 1,000 songs have been played, streamed, 92 billion times. That is how powerful these platforms is, and th that, that these platforms are, and that money is going to the labels. And you fast forward, and their revenues are going to grow. Let's take another example, Netflix. The digital economy is, a, is characterized by what we call network effects. Netflix calls this the flywheel effect. And it's very simple. What it basically says is more customers means more money and more data, which allows you to target your customers more. So you buy more content, and that more content drives more customers, and you get more data and more money, and that wheel keeps turning. And as you optimize your model, the wheel turns faster and faster and faster, and then you win. And that is what is happening with Netflix. They bought the House of Cards. They commissioned two seasons of the House of Cards when every other network turned on even pilot. And the reason they were able to do that 
was because they knew that there were millions of people who loved Kevin Spacey, there were millions of people who loved House of Cards UK, and there were millions of people who loved the genre. And they could target it to you at almost no cost. When you have more data, you win. So what's interesting about Netflix is they were founded, that, by the way, the streaming is also 10 years old, just like the iPhone. They were founded as what's called a long tail company, which is they knew that all of us have eclectic tastes and the kind of movies I like may not be the, the, the kind of movies that, that people, other people like. Um, and, but now what they are going after is the middle. Their big investment is in lavish productions. The queen, the, the crown. They are spending $10 million per episode, $130 million for this season um, to make this happen. And it is because we crave experiences that we can share. And they are still driving traffic with, 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 with the big content. Now, the important thing about Netflix is they've gone, not just Netflix itself, so they've gone from 70 million subscribers to 95 million subscribers in one year alone. I calculate that's about $2 billion in additional revenues in the last 12 months since we were here. But it speaks to the rise of the platforms because the network effects lead to a winner-take-all effect, which means in most industries you get large one or two winners. And so when you think about Facebook and you think about Google and you think about Netflix and you think about Spotify and you think about Amazon, these are all big platforms that dominate the consumer space. So what do you do if you're a movie studio amidst all of the sea of entertainment? What do you, well, Disney Studios has figured it out. And one of the things you actually learn is that you do the same thing as what Netflix is doing. So what has Bob Iger done? He has invested in big brands, big franchises. So they bought Marvel Entertainment. They bought Pixar with Toy Stories. And, 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 and they bought George Lucas with, with Lucas Films with Star Wars, right? They bought the big brands, and that's what people are going to watch. The top five movies in 2016 were all Disney movies. And Warner Brothers is doing exactly the same thing with DC Comics. So the, the model is buy brand, buy franchise, because people go back to the familiar when there is so much choice. It's called the paradox of, of choice. Uh, this is a very, very powerful thing. So even when the digital world doesn't affect you directly, it affects your strategy. And the thing that powers that even more is social media, because social media makes recommendations based on the big films. And recommendation algorithms on Netflix and elsewhere make similar re recommendations. And, and so you end up watching the big product. So let's move to the physical industry, um, the physical world. So in a few years, there is going to be no purely physical world because every dumb object is going to have a sensor and be connected. So I'm not even sure what a purely physical world will look like in a few years. But let's think about the automobile industry because the automobile industry is under siege. It is being attacked by ride-sharing companies like Lyft. It is being attacked by self-driving cars. It is being attacked by millennials who do not want to own cars the way you and I wanted to own cars. And, and so this industry is in an existential crisis and they are trying to figure it out and they are innovating like we have never seen. So this is Daimler with car to go. This is, they offer this in big metropolitan areas. These are cars that they distribute across the city. You can rent it without a reservation. You find the car on your cell phone where it's located. You can drop it back anywhere within a geography, not to the same spot and you rent it by the minute. Not by the hour, not by the day, by the minute. That is how Daimler is trying to figure out what happens in a world when not enough people own cars that they can make a business selling cars. You might want like this one better. This is book by Cadillac. You can get a subscription for a Cadillac, $1,500 a month, and you get this luxury car, and guess what? You can change it 18 times a year. 18 times a year. So we've had fantastic snow this season. So if you want to hop into a Cadillac and go to the mountain, go skiing for the for spring break, you can ask them for an Escalade, and a concierge will deliver it to your door. And then you come back a week later from your ski trip, and it's back to work, and you say, I want a normal sedan. 
And in the summer, you want to go up Big Sur, go up Highway on Big Sur, and you can get one of the cars, you know, a coupe more suited for that. All of the hassles that we've had with car ownership, lousy dealer experience, high insurance rates, gasoline costs, maintenance costs, all the hassles that make it extremely difficult in a busy society are taken away with these models where you don't have to worry about any of these things. And GM is being particularly innovative because what they are focusing on is, 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 is with Lyft, uh, with, with the partnership with Lyft, uh, with their company called Maven, which is like Zipcar. They are doing a lot of interesting things. And then there's Hyundai. Hyundai just launched this car called the Ionic. It's sold as a plug-in hybrid, a hybrid, and an electric. So let's talk about the electric car. It is available by subscription just like the Cadillac, but it has a slightly different model because they are going after millennials and what millennials are familiar with are cell phone calling plans. So they've modeled it after that. You subscribe to this car for two years or three years. Price depends on the car you actually get. Interesting, isn't it? Because they are trying to take away all the pain points from the transaction. But here's where it gets really, really interesting. By the end of this calendar year, this car is going to be what is called level two autonomous, which is exactly what Tesla offers you for $90,000. This car is $35,000, give or take, and it will be the same features, it will have the same fe self-driving features as a Tesla, which costs three times as much. Autonomy is going mark mass market, digital transformation is coming of age. And you really know that digital has come of age uh, when the first commercial use of a self-driving truck is when most of us thought we came of age when we could drink legally, right? <laughs> I just love this story because the first self-driving use of a truck was a beer run. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but, but here's what's interesting. Auto was founded by Google engineers. Uh, and then the company got bought by Uber, which then got so sued by Google for theft of trade secrets. Now, we leave the litigation and the merits of the case to the lawyers and the court, the legal system. But to me, it spoke volumes that the most important asset that companies have today is their intellectual property codified in software. And this is what makes self-driving cars possible. So I want you to think about it this way. A car is not a car. A car is a supercomputer on wheels. And we talk about the smartphone as being the supercomputer in our pockets. Let me just tell you that the most powerful computer that you already own is your car and not your smartphone. There is far more computing power in, 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 in these cars. So when you think about the fact that Intel and, and Qualcomm and NVIDIA are vying to become tier one suppliers to the auto industry, it tells you everything that you need to know. So they're not talking about Delphi and Bosch. We are talking about semiconductor companies being tier one suppliers to, to the auto company. We're going to hear from the director of PACAR later today. Uh, and they are doing, working with NVIDIA in terms of technology in the car. So what are we going to do with all of this technology? Of course, we're going to do self-driving cars. But what we're really going to do is connect them to cities. So cities are going to have sensors on their roads. They're going to have sensors, cameras on traffic lights, sensors everywhere, basically. And what we are going to be able to do is connect these cities to our cars. So cars will talk to each other, cars will talk to the road, cars will talk to the signals, right? Now I want you to imagine the future when we do this. All of us Californians struggle in traffic every single day. The highways are crowded, and if you could just wave a magic wand and make all our problems go away, here is part of the answer. Software allows you to do this. So you may not know this, but we actually, these traffic lights are set by engineers watching traffic for a few hours. And then they set the traffic lights permanently for years. Now what we're talking about is dynamic traffic control through these centralized computers, centralized grids, with a lot of smart software that is optimizing the entire system. And we will be able to get huge improvements in productivity. Software is indeed magical. 
what software allows you to do is wave away the boundaries, the constraints, unshackle yourself from the physical world, and, 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 and abstract away complexity. The traffic system is incredibly complex, but it gets hidden behind the software the, that we see. So we see an interface that makes life easy. There is an enormous amount of complexity that gets into, these, in, in, into software, and it is truly magical for that reason. But software has one more very, very important feature, which is it's cumulative. So when you, and when you write software, or you write a program to do something, it takes you to a baseline. And the next person who has a problem to solve starts with the baseline that you left him or her and builds something on top of that to address the problem that that person is facing. And then that goes into the base. And now we have a higher baseline. And so you don't need to keep reinventing the wheel. You keep starting from a very, very high baseline. That is the power of software. That is something that is not possible in the physical world. Where we see this most often is in the open source world. So this is where these repositories, libraries, where people put a lot of software uh, in, 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 in these repositories. And so let me give you a couple of examples. NASA puts all of its software, because they're mandated to do so by law, into this repository called GitHub. Today, you and I, literally sitting in this room, can go on to GitHub, register, and download all of the Apollo 11 software. Now you're looking at me saying, why the heck would I do that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, but, but the point is, if you were SpaceX, and if you were Virgin Galactic, there's a lot of software that they're doing that is useful to them. But it's even more powerful than that. Today, they have amazing visualization tools. So you can visualize landslides in Nepal or drought conditions in California using NASA software, none of which you actually had to build. But it's not just that. The culture of software, when I mentioned GitHub, there's also something called Stack Overflow. People are putting, so the culture is such that they put enormously valuable code into these repositories and then make it available to the entire world for free. So think about this. We are so used to the physical world that sometimes I don't think we understand how important this is because what this says is no matter which industry, no matter which company, you have access to all of these platforms that you just have to do incremental work on. So when you think of all the servers in the internet, most of them run on something called Apache, which is open source. Linux, which is an operating system, is open source. Swift, which is the language for Apple iPhone smartphones, is open source. All of this stuff is being given, us, given to us for free. It is a gift that we must appreciate in all our companies. Uh, what this tells me is we must learn to think very, very differently because software, the digital economy makes new things possible. We are able to configure things in, in new and interesting ways because before the technology, we didn't have ways of doing that. So, let me, that, that's, so, the, so our world is primarily rectilinear. All our buildings, our homes, our offices tend to be rectangles, right? And, and if you're, objective is to minimize the amount of materials for construction, for building homes, or you want to maximize the living space available to any of us in our homes. Well, it turns out that the geodesic dome designed by Buckminster Fuller is actually the right structure because you get the most living space, the most volume for the least surface area. He, had a, he called this ephemeralization. Do more and more with less and less until you can do everything with nothing. Now, in the physical world, that is impossible. I would hazard a guess that is also impossible in the digital world, but we can get darn close. Because when all of these resources, all of this know-how of the world is codified in software and being made available for free, that is incredibly powerful. So I'm very optimistic about the future and as more and more of us embrace what is being made available to us. Let me give you a couple of examples of how people are doing this. So th this is a company called Wealthfront. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a f fintech company, personal finance management. 
And what's powerful about this is Burton Malkiel, the guy who wrote A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which is one of the best books in finance ever written, it is his know-how merged with technology that they're now putting into all of us, making available to all of us through this company, where it is cheaper than wealth managers, it is, works 24 seven. All of us, for example, have trouble rebalancing our portfolio. Let's say you wanna be 60% stocks and 40% bonds, but you know, things go up and down and you're not doing it. We don't do this very often. This does this 24 seven in real time for very low fees. This is where the world is going. I'll give you another example. If you are unfortunate enough to have a heart arrhythmia, uh, atrial fibrillation, for example, you can die on the spot, unfortunately, and as when you could, could have been saved. And the, the challenge is that we take EKGs for these patients once a month. This company called AliveCore, which is now backed by the Mayo Clinic and Omron, which makes these instruments, is, is you basically tap your fingers on the screen, on, on the sensors, and it takes your EKG and it sends it to your doctor. Now, you've, all, you've been able to do that for a few years, but these were all consumer things. And now what is going on, actually, is that this is an FDA-approved algorithm that physicians can get reimbursed for, and it tells physicians how serious the condition is in a trustworthy way. What was happening before was every patient would send an email to the doctor with their EKG and doctors didn't quite know what to do with it. This is how we are rejiggering the healthcare system. So when I watch the healthcare debate, you know, it's on every day these days, this is what we need to be looking at to bend the, the cost curve for healthcare. These are the kinds of things that will get us ahead because that is ultimately what we need to do. Another thing that we need to do is to adopt what is popularly called the hacker ethos. So when the internet was being built, they had this thing called, this group called the Internet Engineering Task Force. So we use the internet every day. We use something called IP, the Internet Protocols, and they were chafing against the, re the restrictions that came from this authoritarian organization, the International Standards Organization. They were top-down, autocratic, hierarchical, and didn't really understand where the technology was going. And then you have all of these hackers, and I'm talking about the good hackers, by the way. There's a lot of bad hackers out there. Uh, so hacker used to be a, a positive term. Um, and what they tell, what they, that, that, that credo was we reject kings, we reject presidents. What that means is we want a collaborative culture. We don't want a top-down culture. We want people who understand what is going on to make these decisions. What's interesting is they also reject voting, which is they didn't want everybody to vote uh, and, and be so democratic that the smart people couldn't get their voices heard. What they really wanted, what they called it, was rough consensus. Rough consensus simply meaning most people agree. Unanimity is always nice, but you don't often get it. So rough consensus is good. More importantly, it's what they called running code. If you had a solution that worked, and it's good enough, and nobody else has a solution that's as good as yours, let's just go with it. All of us have spent time in companies where we aim for perfection rather than getting to market first. What is important in the digital economy is getting to market first. Being first matters, being perfect matters less. We need to adopt this culture. We must all think like software companies. We need to understand not just Python and Ruby on Rails, that's not important. We need to understand how we codify our knowledge into software. We need to understand the digital economics of software and we need to understand the culture of software and embrace those. When I was in graduate school, Goldman Sachs was a job of choice. We use this phrase, masters of the universe. And if you've seen Wall Street or you've seen Wolf on Wall Street, you'll know what I'm talking about. These were the people who moved the world because their investments in currencies and in, in futures drove the world. They were truly called masters of the universe. Today, you have a better chance of being hired at Goldman Sachs as a software engineer than as an investment banking whiz, because they have more software engineers at Goldman Sachs. Goldman is a software company. In a couple of sentences, their trading platform, their traders, they used to have 600 traders. Today, they have two, but they have 200 software engineers. They give away their software 
they have this platform called Marquee. They built something called SecDB, which was a risk management platform that actually was their proprietary know-how. Um, and it was not to be shared with anybody. They wouldn't even be, give it to their clients. Today, they are giving it to their clients for free. That is the world we live in today because that locks their clients into them. They make their clients better off, but they make themselves better off. One third of their employees are engineers. Goldman is a software company. I couldn't get any more, any further away from Goldman Sachs than by talking about agriculture because it's about the oldest industry there is. Take a look at this tractor. There's computers in it. What they are now able to do, this is Monsanto has the largest library of, of, uh, of hybrid seeds, but they bought this company called Climate Corp, which maps every single uh, field in America, and there's 25 million of these things. But they are able, acre by acre, half acre by half acre, to understand the soil consistency, the richness, the fertility, and they are able to make recommendations about where to plant, how dense you should plant, how deep the seed should go. And one of the things you may not realize is there's a lot of variability in seeds. They can drive yield up by 5% inside a year, which is more than any other single intervention can make. This is the power of software in something as low-tech as historically low-tech. These fields, these tractors are actually self-controlled. They're GPS-driven and they drive themselves. As the power of software has gotten larger and larger, those that understand the power of software are winning. And those that don't understand how software can help them and are not keeping up are falling further and further behind. These are not small victories. This is Secretariat winning the Kentucky Derby in 1973, probably the greatest racehorse of all time, winning by two and a half lengths. Lots and lots of competitors. And then you go through the Preakness and you go to the Belmont Stakes and what you end up with is a 31 length victory. That is what is happening in the digital world as well. The companies like Netflix, the companies like Amazon are pulling further and further ahead. The Goldmans, the Monsantos are all pulling further and further ahead and it's getting awfully risky to wait longer to make your play. What do you need to do? How, what do you, what do we as companies do? Number one, so we've done a lot of research on this and we've been running an annual survey and we've got a lot of insights from this. Number one, you need to build a compelling vision. And it's not a vision that says, I want to be a better university, I want to be a, build a better mousetrap. Lyft founder, John Zimmer, is actually talking about the transportation revolution. He says, imagine a world without cars and what this does is all the parking lots, the parking structures, the street side parking all goes away. And imagine green space. Imagine a world of self-driving cars and believe that the self-drive, he believes that the world of self-driving cars will have, will be dominated by companies that manage fleets. So Lyft is focused on a core competence of managing complexity in routing managing peak loads. That is what their platform does and that is what is allowing them to win. Then you need to invest in software talent. Most of us don't have the capabilities that we need in the talent. Uh, so this is JP Morgan. And so what they have done, they have 20,000 software engineers and you know, they're a bank. They understand lending money. But it turns out there's all of these contracts that need to be analyzed. And they've built machine learning software that does that for them. And it's 360,000 hours that they can do in seconds. It's what lawyers spend 360,000 hours a year doing, and they can now do in seconds. The late C.K. Prolod, the founder of the idea of core competence, basically talked about what needs to be something that your company really is good at. And that, my friends today, is software and we all have to figure out how to build software companies. The great companies like Target and Delta and Ford Motor Company and Tesla all have built huge in-house software departments where they were not doing so in the same way just a few short years ago. And then we have to transform the culture. This is the biggest single stumbling block. 
culture gets in the way. We're hierarchical, we don't listen to the people who get the technology, incentive systems are met up, are, 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 are counterproductive, we, we don't work across disciplines, um, the traditional sort of fights with the new, it's, it's something that we all need to transform. And then we need to upgrade our infrastructure. We're all familiar with what happened to Delta, what happened to United. You know, when there was a big systems failure brought the airline to its knees. Now, I want you to think about this. You know, we think about an airline going down or aircraft not able to fly, but these are people going to important business meetings. These are people going to weddings. These are people going to funerals. These are people going to see people in the hospital. The customer cost of these failures is very, very high. And in a digital world, these are simply unacceptable. Trust is essential. We talked about a world where uh, in, in banking, we used to have these marble, marble floors and columns because they were signifying reliability that they will not steal your money. If we have enough money to build this fancy building, we're not gonna steal your money. We need to do the same thing for digital trust because the most important asset that we all own today is our digital identity and it needs to be sacrosanct. Uh, this is Seattle in 1909. Electric trolleys, horses and buggies, and so on. Uh, and then you look ahead in 1962, and this was the result of the second industrial revolution. Electricity, internal combustion engines, and when you think about it on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't make sense of this because the world keeps moving. It's useful to stop and look back 50 years and see what just happened. Right? And you see all of this progress. This was the space race. This was when we were motivated as a country to, to, to shoot for the moon, literally. Right? Uh, and then you look to 2017, and that's what it looks like. So the world keeps moving forward faster and faster. Now, from the time you were born, electricity didn't change very much. From the, right? I mean, we still had the wall out that you plug appliances into. Nothing's changed. In the digital revolution, everything changes every single day. And so the, 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 the advancement that we have to live at, the change we're going through, keeps accelerating. I like to say, get used to the in-between. It's not going away. We're living between a physical world and a digital world, and the pace is just going to get faster and faster, and we have to get used to it. We tend to see the world through a rearview mirror because that's the frame we understand. We think about things we are giving up, and we are not able to see the world of the future. Um, you know, you look at the Kodak Brownie and you look at, at the Buick 58, great products for the time, which of us will want to buy them? A friend of mine who's an economist was asked, if I made you three times as rich, would you be willing to live 100 years ago? And he says, no. And the guy says, you didn't even think about it. And he says, no, because I would be dead at my age. So we make a lot of progress. Uh, uh, uh. You know, we make a lot of progress and we don't stop to think of how far we've come. So don't think about what we're giving up, but it's very easy to do that because we understand the frame of the present. What we have to focus on is the future. The New York Times said it best. The status quo is not an option. This is the, the, the gray lady, the sort of one of the all-time great newspapers in our country. And they went through really hard times. As we know, revenues were plummeting, um, uh, profits were down, print media, print, print circulation, print advertising, all down, digital slowly creeping up, but nowhere close to what they need. They were in an existential crisis. And, and they finally saw the light and have begun this amazing reinvention process. They want to prove that the, a digital first model of boots on the ground, high quality journalism is, is, is sustainable. It is an existential crisis for them, and I would argue that it is an existential crisis for us, because good journalism is essential to democracy. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with this one quote from the New York Times editor. To do nothing or to be timid in imagining the future would mean being left behind. There are many once mighty companies that believe their history of success would ine inevitably protect them from technological change only to be done in by their complacency. I want to leave you with this. You have to get in the ring and fight. You have to slug it out every single day. The journey is not going to be easy, but you cannot wait any longer. 
the, the winners are already pulling away, and this is the time for you to get in and fight. Thank you very much for your attention.